This video uh, is a very short video uh, just to elaborate a little bit on our conclusions in video 33. Uh, you can see here uh, the notes that we had for video 33. And um, at the end of the video, we came down uh, to the following conclusion. When Alice, and we're right uh, here, you see the cursor there. Uh, when Alice measures the first n qubits of C3 with the standard basis, <coughs> she will obtain this. Now, uh, the, first the first thing that's important to understand is that that would not be true. That could not be factored out in that way if this term here were not a constant. If this term uh, were changing, then you would need to expand these sums term by term. But because uh, this does not change with either z or x, this is simply a constant, then basically we're factoring it out and the first n, term, n qubits are given by this. And so this is what Alice will measure with the standard basis. And now we're trying to evaluate this. Now keep in mind that as we're going to see very soon uh, when I do a couple of examples, this expression right here can be rather involved. In fact, what we're going to see is that uh, when n is equal to 1, so that we're talking about 1 qubit states, even in that simplest of cases, we will have four terms to sum. reason for that is that when n is equal to 1, then x has to range over all of the possible one qubit states uh, under consideration, which would be zero and one. And likewise, z has to range over zero and one. So we will have all four possibilities there to consider. And um, so, so we have four terms in this sum, even in the case n equals one. And when n is equal to two, we will have, that would jump all the way up to 16 terms because uh, when n is equal to 2, then there's four possibilities for x, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1, and likewise the same four possibilities for z, and so 4 times 4 would give us 16 terms here to consider. And, uh, you know, just to do one more example, when n is equal to 3, then there's eight possibilities for x, eight possibilities for z, and so we'd have 64 terms. So this summation here has quite a few terms in it, and uh, so if there's any way at all <clears throat> that we can get some kind of advantage in trying to evaluate it, then we should certainly take advantage of that. And um, that's what the the... Well, that's what is being done in this analysis right here. The analysis is, is a, admittedly uh, a little bit confusing because it takes sort of a roundabout way to um, evaluate the sum, but it, it does make the evaluation very quick uh, as long as you follow it. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is explain the idea again one more time, uh, just, just um, sort of a hand-waving argument. And then we'll go look at a couple of examples and see how it works out just as predicted. So <clears throat> in trying to evaluate this double summation here, what we're going to do is rather than expanding it with all of those terms, what we're going to do instead is just to look at the first term in the Z summation. The first term in the z summation will be the zero ket, but but keep in mind now that means the zero ket, uh, the zero n qubit, the n qubit zero ket. So in other words, it's the ket with n zeros, 
And we're just going to look at first, in trying to get a handle of what this summation is equal to, we're going to look first at just that, that one ket, that one term uh, in this sum. So that's what we say here. Consider the term obtained when z is equal to, uh, and here we have n zeros. Now, <clears throat> uh, for that case, if, if all of the entries in z are zero, then for sure x dot z is zero. And so for that one term, what this will become is one over two to the n times the summation over x. We're not summing over z anymore. We're only looking at one term in z, and that's just the zero term. But, but keep in mind now, this is really, this zero ket here is really n zeros, okay? So, um, and, and since we have already said that x dot z is zero, then the exponent of negative one just becomes negative one to the f of x power. Now again, it's important to realize that is not, we're not claiming that that is this entire sum. This is just the one term when z is equal to zero. So let's see what happens. Well, we can see here that if f of x is always equal to zero, then this is always negative one to the zero power, which is one. And so we have, um, uh, we, we're just summing up this zero ket two to the n times, because remember, um, we will look at two to the n different values for the x uh, ket. So when we sum up zero, two to the n times, uh, well, that's actually, I guess I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Let's, so, so first of all, we'll just leave it like this. So if f of x is always zero, then it ends up being this, okay? Uh, because uh, negative one to the zero power is one. Okay, and likewise, if f of x is constant and equal to one, then we have negative one to the first power, which is negative one. So we get this summation. But if f of x is balanced, if half the time this is equal to negative 1 and half the time is equal to positive 1, then all of those terms will drop out and we'll get 0. But again, that doesn't mean the entire summation is 0. It just means that the part of it associated with z equals 0 is equal to 0. Okay, now... To evaluate these first two terms, remember uh, that x will vary over all 2 to the nth power uh, n qubit kets. So if we're summing up uh, this same thing 2 to the n times, we will get 2 to the n times that, and then 2 to the n times 1 over 2 to the n, so we will just get, we'll just get 0 in that case. And likewise, here we will have negative zero. But it's important to realize now that this C3, the, our original input in this problem, has a magnitude of one. So, Everything that we're doing here, well, nothing that we're doing here is going to change the magnitude of the state. So when we finish, C3 is also going to have a magnitude of 1. And likewise, uh, when, when Alice measures the first 10 qubits, that will have a magnitude of 1. So... Um, what we can say then is we come down here and we see that what Alice measures right here, uh, that is equal to the zero ket if f of x is always zero, and it's equal to the minus of the zero ket if f of x is always one. Well, what's the magnitude of the zero ket? It's one. So this right here, which we have so far, we've only proven that it's equal to that. We haven't proven that it's equal to the entire sum. Remember, this is the entire sum, 
And this is just one term out of that sum. But we have shown that this one term in these two cases, in both of these first two cases, when f of x is constant, that one term alone has a magnitude of 1. And yet the whole thing has a magnitude of 1. So actually, this is the entire expression. All the other terms up here, when z is not equal to 0, would cancel out, both when f of x is always equal to 0 and when f of x is always equal to 1. Let me say that one more time. Whenever f of x is constant, all of the terms in this sum are going to go away except for the term where z is equal to 0. And we know that because that one term we have shown has a magnitude of 1, and this has a magnitude of 1, so there, there's no more left. But on the other hand, uh, when f of x is balanced, then this one term, the 0 term, or the term associated with 0, has no magnitude at all. And so this is what allows us to conclude that whenever f of x is constant, then, and it doesn't matter now if uh, f of x is constant and equal to 0 or constant and equal to 1, Alice will measure 0. So she will measure 0 if f of x is constant, and she will definitely not measure 0 if f of x is balanced. We don't know for sure what she'll measure. It could be uh, any of those other n terms, but we're just not really sure. Uh, excuse me any of those other 2 to the n minus 1 terms, but, um, but it won't be the 0 ket. So that is the idea of this very clever way of uh, evaluating this double summation. We, we, have, um, we can evaluate the double summation, just to summarize this, we can evaluate this double summation when f of x is constant and equal to 0 or when uh, f of x is constant and equal to 1. We can actually evaluate it, and we've done that right here. When f of x is balanced, uh, we, we don't have an easy way to evaluate it, but we can say for sure that when you do evaluate it, the coefficient of the zero term, in that case, when f of x is balanced, the coefficient of the zero term will be zero. So now, to finally uh, make this uh, even a little clearer, I hope it's clear already, but to make this a little clearer, let's actually look at the n equal 1 and n equal 2 cases. So here, I have uh, repeated our expression for C3, and um, um, <clears throat> here again is what Alice obtains when she measures the first n qubits. And, and uh, as I noted already, uh, you could not factor out these n terms like that unless this were a constant. If this were not a constant, then you would have to look at this more carefully. Okay? But uh, in, in the case under consideration, that is a constant, and so we're um, able to say that these are the first n qubits. Uh, this is what um, Alice measures. And um, now we're going to come down here and actually evaluate that. It says to help us understand this better, we will consider the cases n equal 1 and n equal 2. Okay? So, um, when n equals 1, we must let both x and z range over all possible 1 qubit states. That is, if x, that is, x can be 0 or 1, and z can be 0 or 1. So, we proceed as follows. So, this, this again, right here, this is the expression for what Alice measures, the first n qubits. And when n is equal to 1, that will become the following. Now, uh, we first, in, in everything we're going to do here, we will first expand the z summation. So we first let z equal to 0 ket. And so we have uh, x dot z becomes x dot 0 plus f of x. We bring that down, and z is equal to 0. And then we also let z be the 1 ket. So then we have x dot 1 plus f of x, and here's the 1 ket. Now, 
we sum over x. And x, again, x will range over 0 and 1 as well. And we have to, we have to let x equal 0 over this whole term, and then we have to let x equal 1 over this whole term. Now, when we let x equal 0, then this will become 0.0, .0 plus f of 0 times 0. And then this will become negative 1 to the 0 0.1 plus f of 0 times 1. That's what we, this is, this uh, parenthetical expression is what we get when x is equal to 0. And then this one is what we get when x is equal to 1. And so we get, uh, now when x is equal to 1, we get 1 0 plus f of 1 there, and 1 1 plus f of 1 here. And if we group uh, all four of these terms uh, a little bit differently, then we will come down here and get this. So we have the one half, and then we have uh, the zero cat is multiplied by negative one to the f of zero plus negative one to the f of one. And the one cat is multiplied by negative one to the f of zero minus negative one to the f of one. And now look at that for a moment. If, and just think about it, if f is constant, if, again, if f is constant, well, that means that f of 0 is equal to f of 1. And if f of 0 is equal to f of 1, then these two terms right here, since we have a negative sign there, these two terms are going to cancel. So this will go away. And on the other hand, these two terms, if f of 0 is equal to f of 1, these two terms will be the same. So either this is going to give us a sum of negative 2 or a sum of 2. And then don't forget this 1 half out there. So we're going to get either negative 1 or 1 times the 0 ket. And in fact, we get 1 times the 0 ket if both of them are equal to zero, and we'll get negative one times the zero ket if both of them are equal to uh, one. So this is exactly what we predicted from our analysis above. If f is constant, then we get, then the magnitude of the coefficient of the zero ket is one. But if f is balanced, now keep it, if f is balanced, these two terms, that means that f of 0 and f of 1 <clears throat> are different from each other. And so one of these terms will be equal to 1, and one of them will be equal to negative 1. And so this will cancel out, and we definitely don't get 0 in that case, because the coefficient of the 0 ket is 0 if f is balanced. Now, I think it's even more convincing when you look at the case n equals 2, so let's do that. And... Um, uh, here, again, is our expression from above for what Alice measures uh, the first n qubits. And when we evaluate that for n equals 2, now, again, <clears throat> this is going to be a little tedious because, remember, this means that z must be allowed to vary over 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. And likewise, x must be very, uh, allowed to vary off over all four. So when we when we set z equals 0, 0, we get x dot 0, 0. Looking now for a moment just at this z summation, then we have um, an n is equal to 2. So 1 over 2 squared is 1 fourth. And we have summation over x. And now, like I say, uh, z equals 0, 0 first. So we have x dot 0, 0 plus f of x times 0, 0. And here we have x dot 0, 1 plus f of x times the 0, 1 cat. Here we have negative 1 to the x dot 1, 0 plus f of x times the 1, 0 cat. And then negative 1 to the x dot 1, 1 plus f of x times the 1, 1 cat. And then we have to uh, evaluate this term in the brackets four different times. Because we sum, we're summing over x. And again, we have to let x equal 0, 0. We have to evaluate this whole term for uh, this whole bracketed term for x equals 0, 0. We have to evaluate the whole thing for x equals 0, 1. Then evaluate the whole thing for x equals 1, 0. And finally evaluate the whole thing for x equals 1, 1. And add it all up. And when we do that, um, here, right here, starting with this bracket right there, and ending with this bracket, that's what we will get. But fortunately, uh, if you look down here, 
at uh, these last two lines. Here we go. Last two lines here. You can see that that does condense. And so we have this coefficient. And keep in mind that one fourth is out here. This coefficient for the zero zero uh, cat. This coefficient for the zero one cat. This coefficient for the one zero cat. And this coefficient for the one one cat. And if you look at those once again, you will see that if f is constant, it doesn't matter whether f is uh, equal to always equal to zero or always equal to one. If as long as f is constant, then the uh, magnitude of the coefficient of the zero zero cat, once you take into account this one fourth out here, will be one. And and the coefficients for all of the others will be zero. And so in that case, when f is constant, Alice is definitely measuring zero zero. On the other hand, when f is balanced, now we don't know which one of the, well, actually we'll have a mixture of all three of these, but when f is constant, the, the coefficient of zero zero will go away. So once again, if f, I think I might have said that incorrectly, so let me make sure. If f is balanced, this coefficient disappears. The other coefficients, we can't really predict exactly what they are unless we know a little bit about, um, a little more about f, but that's not important. The point is that if f is balanced, our coefficient of the zero, zero cat is zero. So in the case when f is constant, we will definitely, uh, Alice will definitely measure the zero, zero cat. And on the case, in the case where F is balanced, she will definitely not measure the zero, zero cat. So I hope that by comparing uh, these two examples with our previous work, that it makes this idea uh, a little bit clearer.